Good afternoon. My name is uh, Asher Kaufman, and I'm the director of the Kroc Institute uh, for International uh, Peace Studies. Uh, it's really exciting to see so many unruly people. Uh, I guess it, it fits uh, your reputation and the reason for which uh, you are all uh, here. Uh, so I really, I'm, I'm very pleased that we are hosting this uh, institute, this uh, uh, conference. Uh, it's it's uh, clearly a very important conference uh, for us. It squarely fits within uh, our mission as a, as a peace uh, institute. Uh, as we all know, wars have been a central field of inquiry since the dawn of uh, history. Anti-war action has also been studied extensively. But rarely has there been enough attention to anti-war activism within militaries enduring wartime. And uh, clearly, uh, for many of you, this is uh, not only a scholarly engagement, but uh, a personal journey, personal experience. And uh, I could sense the excitement as I was walking here, trying to make my way to, uh, to get uh, to here. So this conference does exactly that. It brings these two uh, fields to, together, the study of war and the study of uh, anti-war activity during wartime, which is really uh, worthy. I'm extremely thankful for David Courtright for his leadership here at Croc and for his hard work to make this important conference uh, happen. And I'm also thankful for Croc staff who have uh, assisted David in, this, uh, in the organization and execution of this uh, conference. Just to mention a few names, Lisa, Laurel, El, uh, Ellie, and uh, Grace have all been very helpful in making it all happen. <laughs> Rumors go that David has also recruited his own family. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I see Karen here and your son is here. So thank you for all this. Uh, makes it all a uh, family enterprise, uh, which is uh, add to the level of excitement and the uh, intimacy. So we have uh, three distinguished uh, uh, speakers here in this uh, panel, uh, titled Historical Perspectives on the Vietnam Anti-War uh, Movement. Uh, I will uh, present all three of them together uh, and uh, so that we save time in between uh, speakers. Uh, starting with uh, Christian Appy, who is a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts. His research uh, specialties include uh, modern United States history and the Vietnam uh, War. He is the author of uh, American Reckoning, the Vietnam War and Our National Identity from 2015. Patriots, the Vietnam War remembered from all sides from 2003, and Working Class War, American Combat Soldiers, and Vietnam from 1993. Uh, Madame Ni is the president of the Ho Chi Minh City Peace and Development Foundation. Uh, she is the former vice, vice chair of Vietnam's National Assembly of the Foreign Affairs Committee. She is actively engaged in raising public awareness on sustainable development, gender advancement, and youth empowerment, as well as rapprochement with the, the Vietnamese diaspora and the impact of uh, war legacies such as uh, Agent Orange dioxin, uh, dioxin in uh, Vietnam. And last uh, but not least, uh, Michael Kazin, who is a professor of history at Georgetown University, who specializes in US politics and social movements of the 19th and 20th century. He is the editor of uh, Dissent, a leading magazine of the American left since 1954. Uh, his books include War Against War, uh, The American Fight for Peace 1914 to 1918, uh, just published last year, and The American Dreamers, How the Left Changed the, a Nation from 2011. Each speaker has uh, 20 minutes uh, to speak, and I will uh, bring some order to this, uh, uh, this order, and they will be very strict in uh, uh, stopping them from their, uh, making sure that they uh, keep up their 20 minutes so that we have uh, ample time for questions and answers. Uh, so the floor is yours. Questions, please. Thanks. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you to everyone at the Kroc Institute for <coughs> including me. Uh, quite honestly, this is one of the great honors of my life to join you. Um, I saw something extraordinary out in the gallery in the hallway that I thought I would share with you. It's a quotation from Dr. Howard Levy, 
who, as many in the room know, was uh, an army doctor who in the mid-60s refused to um, train Green Beret medics to go to Vietnam, for which, uh, not surprisingly, he was court-martialed and convicted and, and jailed. Uh, he apparently said at one point, and I'm quoting, future historians choosing to ignore the GI movement will find their reputation in tatters. <laughs> I like that, but maybe 50 years is too soon to judge. But quite honestly, I don't know a single historian whose reputation has been hurt by not knowing about the GI movement. So sorry to begin on that negative, that negative note, but uh, uh, it makes me think that the, the feeling I have most, uh, above all, being here is the wish that uh, my students uh, could be here to talk with you and to listen about all the ideas and experiences and history that are so uh, alive and palpable uh, in this room. So uh, I fervently hope not only will historians be uh, defamed for not knowing about all of you, that it will inspire all of us uh, to do a better job at communicating to all generations across all boundaries about the power and potential of uh, peacemaking. I especially uh, wish my students were here because it seems to me that for four decades since the end of the Vietnam War, uh, most of them actually have heard very positive stories, very few positive stories about any anti-war activist, civilian or military. Uh, I think in, this, in recent years, I do feel more and more students um, have the, uh, the basis for some kind of critique of the war. They've seen horrible pictures for it. They, they may even have heard the, the term American imperialism. But what they, what they do clearly lack is an understanding that um, the, um, the basis for a critical analysis of that war or any war, or n never mind all the other problems we're suffering, emerges from social movements and anti-war movements. Those are the groups that provide the education and the information as, as well as the confrontation to raise those issues. Uh, so they, 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 they haven't learned uh, to uh, acknowledge or affirm the importance of social movements. Indeed, in the decades since Vietnam, the most vibrant and diverse anti-war movement in our history has either disappeared from common uh, public memory or it has been uh, uh, lampooned, uh, un, uh, falsely stereotyped, and even demonized. Uh, think only of the movie Forrest Gump. Now, that's an old movie now, 1990 or whatever it was, but actually uh, most students that I've asked uh, have seen it. Uh, and. Uh, the, the, the one thing that you may remember about it is that it, it, uh, it uh, has a scene in which Forrest Gump comes back wearing the highest medal conferred, uh, Medal of Honor, and he's surrounded in an anti-war demonstration by uh, sort of five Abby Hoffman look-alikes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when, when uh, Forrest Gump is introduced to sort of the, 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 the heavy, the anti-war heavy guy, uh, the activist, he takes one look at Forrest Gump and he says, uh, who's this baby killer? So that in a nutshell shows the, the reinforcements uh, of the kind of uh, the uh, stereotypes that, that, that David alluded to at the very beginning of uh, today and that uh, Jerry Lemke uh, has written about and David Parsons and half the people in this, uh, in this audience. Uh, but. Um, uh, so, so as a result of that, um, we, we have, uh, I think, too much bro broadly in our land, and not just young people, but, but 40 somethings I, am quite, I know very well, who uh, sort of see the, 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 um, the generation of the 60s divided in, into two camps. There uh, are the, the anti-war civilians, and, and the anti-war movement is almost entirely thought of as, civil, as civilians with no relationship to the military, as hopelessly uh, self-righteous, self-absorbed, uh, and, and mean, and nasty, uh, and jerks, pe people who like nothing better uh, than to, uh, to, to spit upon or at least in some way or another uh, express disdain uh, 
uh, for returning uh, veterans. And then on the other side, this image of veterans as kind of patriotic uh, hero victims. They're not, they're not unequivocal uh, heroes, but they have a kind of victim status. Uh, the, the classic example of that, of course, is, is Rambo. I mean, Rambo just so totally fits that, 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 definite, that, that sort of image of the, of the, the hero victim. Um, so um, to follow this just a step further, I've had many students over the years who honestly believe that the most shameful thing about the Vietnam War is the treatment accorded to returning American veterans, not the three million Vietnamese who were killed in the war and the million plus that were killed in Laos and Cambodia, not the eight million tons of bombs that were dropped uh, on Southeast Asia, not the indiscriminate uh, use of napalm in Agent Orange and the thousands of villages that were destroyed and the millions of people that were forcibly relocated from their ancestral homelands, not even, uh, uh, and uh, it may seem minor, uh, uh, in contrast to those graphic uh, absences of knowledge, but uh, there's a, a scant uh, knowledge that the United States, from the very outset of our intervention uh, going back to the 1940s, have subverted uh, the possible democratic outcomes uh, uh, that would have um, made a, a war unnecessary, uh, both in the immediate aftermath of World War II and at the Geneva Accords, which called for a nationwide election uh, under a single government. So we always have to ask, uh, what is the purpose of, of myths? Uh, and the, the myth of the, the, the veteran as patriot, the anti-protester as disloyal, what function does it serve? What political use does it have? And um, it serves many uses, but the most obvious is uh, it serves to undergird and support American imperialism. Uh, and beyond that, to, um, to bolster a faith that was shredded by the Vietnam War the faith in American exceptionalism. They, the whole point of my most recent book, American Reckoning, is to try to suggest that the Vietnam War, more than any other event in our history, undermined that broad faith that the United States is in an, uh, everywhere and always a force for good in the world, always the good guys in world history, always on the side of democracy and freedom and human rights. By 1969 and 1970, uh, that was in tatters. I mean, even, even pro-war supporters, when confronted with the evidence of my lie, uh, the, only, the best response they could come up with was, uh, well, this happens in all wars. Uh, every, every country c c commits war crimes. Well, once you concede that, you've pretty much thrown American exceptionalism out the window, haven't you? I mean, uh, if, 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 if everybody does it, aren't we supposed to put a higher price uh, on life than other countries? That was sort of a bedrock uh, idea in American exceptionalism. Of course, the uh, problem with this myth is it also, of course, um, makes us uh, forget the, uh, the fact that many soldiers themselves uh, were involved in anti-war activism. And, and, and it as well makes us uh, fail to see that there were many uh, sincere and actually successful efforts of collaboration between the civilian anti-war movement uh, and, uh, and active duty. Uh, military personnel. Uh, if uh, you hoped that the Ken Burns Lynn Novick documentary would write that ship <coughs> and, and correct it, I'm afraid uh, not. It did indeed sort of reinforce uh, our distorted view of uh, vets as noble victims and the anti-war movement was, uh, was hardly represented at all. Indeed there are only two, uh, actually two people uh, in that film, by my count, uh, who represented the anti-war movement who lacked any uh, affiliation uh, to the military through a family relationship or were <coughs> actually in the service themselves. And both of them, at least on camera, who knows what was cut, but at least on camera, Zimmerman and Nancy uh, Bieberman, they, they are allowed, what they say is mostly critical of the anti-war movement and sort of reinforces this idea that they were uh, sort of self-serving and mean, and mean to veterans. Um, on the other hand, to its credit, one thing that uh, is uh, laudable to a degree about the uh, Burns-Novick documentary is it does have uh, um, veterans 
uh, American Vietnam veterans on camera uh, talking about their uh, coming to anti-war position on the war and even uh, joining in the anti-war movement. There, there are quite a, quite a few, and that's valuable. My, my problem with the way that's handled, however, is that these, these veterans speak inside a bubble. Uh, quite literally, the way they're framed, with these quite, very close uh, um, uh, headshots. And um, uh, so it, they are abstracted from their own history. They are looking back uh, on their history and telling their story. But there's, there's no sense of engagement with either the past uh, or the present. The bubble is, is the present as well. They're not engaging with uh, the, the current wars. I mean, I kept thinking, why don't they show these veterans walking through Vietnamese villages or interacting with a, a group of other veterans, sharing their experiences? Or even better yet, why, don't, or why aren't they shown talking uh, to uh, veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan uh, wars and uh, sharing experiences across time? Uh, if, I may have missed something, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Was the word Afghanistan or Iraq even uttered once in that 18 hours of that documentary? I don't, I don't think no, so. No, you didn't miss anything, bro. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so our job is obvious, and a number of, of people have already mentioned that, and that is to, to really try to recover and communicate this extraordinarily rich and varied history of anti-war Descent and to try to connect it to the, the present. Um, uh, very briefly, I, I want to suggest to you that uh, th this is an effort in the creation of a long history of the peace movement and a long history of GI and veteran descent. I'm borrowing that phrase uh, from uh, Jacqueline Dowd Hall, a historian who about 12 years ago wrote a, a pretty famous article in a uh, uh, historical journal saying that the civil rights movement uh, should be studied as a long history, that the, the conventional chronology really just focuses on a few years in the 60s, but there, that's a movement that has very deep roots. And so, so too, I think, with the study of peace. And I, I'm gonna, that's all I'm going to say, because I have suspect that, that Michael will have some uh, things to say about that longer history of uh, anti-war act, activist. So let's, let me just make a... a my own little effort to try to bring us back to uh, the GI uh, anti-war movement of the 60s and, and 70s by uh, telling a short story that's pro probably familiar to, to a number of you about uh, two uh, very young uh, African-American uh, Marines, uh, George Daniels and William Harvey, uh, who in the summer of 1967 uh, were uh, at, uh, at Pendleton, Camp Pendleton, that's okay. And uh, they uh, conducted a uh, sort of rap session after lunchtime chow with about 15 other African American soldiers. And they uh, raised a very important question uh, Is this our war? To which George Jan says, No, this is not our war. This is a white man's war. And uh, our war is here at home. And indeed, it's raging right now in the streets of Detroit, where we are now in the fifth day of the, the, the worst uh, urban riot uh, of, uh, uh, of, of the decade. 43 dead, 8,000 National Guard brought in to suppress disorder, uh, almost 5,000 uh, paratroopers from the 82nd uh, Airborne. So he made this case that became very familiar uh, in the 1960s, the, the racial one. And what, uh, for that, uh, uh, he and Harvey uh, were court-martialed and convicted uh, of uh, uh, Daniel's 10 years of hard labor in the Portsmouth Naval uh, Prison, sort of Alcatraz of New England, uh, six years for Harvey. They appealed it. The appeal failed. They were convicted on the, the Smith Act, which is bizarre if you know anything about that, uh, as well as the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The appeal failed. Uh, they did get the sentence dropped to I think four and three years, but still, it shows you so dramatically how hard the military can crack down on dissent and the obstacles to the creation of a GI movement, and particularly how hard uh, the sentences are for uh, 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 service people of color. Uh, not that white people were exempt, but the sentences were almost never uh, as, as harsh. Um, they were convicted simply of talking 
about the Vietnam War. They had, there had been no mutiny, no disobedience whatsoever, simply for talking about the war. Now, the key point I want to make here is if you jump just four years ahead to 1971, while the military could still crack down hard, and there was still real brutality in the brigs, which were filling up to the max. I mean, uh, there, there was torture in the Pendleton Brig in 1969. I've seen illustrations of the stress, the tying people up in the stress positions. But, so they could still be tough, but there's no way if they had to uh, put everyone in the brig who was talking against the war, talking to hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, so by then we really had a mass movement led by working class soldiers, multiracial, not all together, not all, and not an integrated movement. Uh, that, that itself is an important subject to pursue. I mean, the, the, the key years of anti-war uh, protest, as people have sort of suggested, coincided with the rise of black nationalism, the Black Panther movement, so it's really not a surprise that these movements, as, as David Courtright and other people have, have, have written, ran in tandem or parallel rather than much uh, 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 interchange. And there are other reasons for that too. I mean, I think even uh, one of the v VVAW did a very creative thing in, in playing on patriotic iconography. They called their investigation the Winter Soldier after Tom Paine. They marched on Valley Forge. They did an occupation of the Statue of Liberty. They marched on Lexington Green. They went to, you know, uh, what's her name, Bessie Ross's house. All these two, you know, raise challenges to this, are we living up to our revolutionary tradition? But to a growing number of African Americans who believed that they, they lived, and all people of color lived in, in colonized neighborhoods and reservations, they would say, why, why are we even referring to the American Revolution? We still, the revolution is yet to come. So anti-colonialism begins at home, begins here, and then we can make it globally. So there were these tensions that we still have to think about in, in trying to um, um, you, you know, bring uh, everyone uh, into this um, into the struggle. There was, uh, as the decade went on, every imaginable protest, though they began earlier than many people uh, understand. I've recently, I keep coming across uh, examples of combat avoidance, not yet direct combat refusal, not mutiny, but as early as 66 and 67, you have units sandbagging operations, in your body, meaning they just go out to a safe place even though they've been ordered to go in a more dangerous ambush or operation. Uh, even, in the, even in the Marines, I, I recently met a guy who was there in 67, and he said even some lieutenants were participating. But the other, you know, it, it involved everything from dress violations to petitions to, you know, uh, uh, letters, to, hundreds of thousands of letters to Congress, uh, underground newspapers, uh, skyrocketing desertions, skyrocketing applications for CO uh, status in, uh, uh, within the military, uh, and, out, and outright mutiny. In 1975, even the military admitted that there were 35 instances of mutiny within the 1st Cavalry Division alone. And those were only the ones they counted. And so by the end uh, of the war, uh, many studies have shown that nearly half of everyone in the military had committed some act of disobedience. So I wouldn't at all marginalize this as a minority movement. This was a mass movement. And indeed, if you look at that figure and, and ask how many people disobeyed on college campuses, I bet you it doesn't rise to that level. So that really was the center. And, uh, you know, there should be this bumper sticker in the mid-60s, you know, suppose they gave a war and nobody came. And everyone rightly said, that's sort of hopelessly naive. I mean, the, you know, isn't it? I mean, the military can get the people it needs. But by the end of the war, that bumper sticker was actually becoming close uh, to a reality. Or to borrow a phrase from Richard Moser, I think is here in his book, he, he says a, a very significant minority of the American military had declared a ceasefire in this war. And so briefly, just to say, chalk up some of the achievements, I do agree with uh, not maybe everyone here, but a number of you, that it did, uh, the GI movement did, uh, 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 didn't end the war soon enough, but it did, uh, it did, I think, end the war sooner than it might have been. And I think we'll learn more about that when Carolyn Eisenberg's book gets published. Um, okay, uh, just, yeah, w one final thing. It did also play a role in the end, I think, of the draft. And one sort of interesting thing that doesn't get noted uh, is that uh, they raised the standards of work. Uh, how, what un how many unions in the country have uh, 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 raised the pay of any worker from $126 a month in 1971 to 326 bucks a month in 74. 
that was the GI movement that did that. Uh, so lots more to talk about. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Friends, uh, I'd like to start by thanking David Courtright and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at uh, Notre Dame University for uh, affording me this opportunity to take part in what I consider uh, the third in a series of events that uh, deal with the anti-war movement uh, in the U.S., particularly among the military. I was fortunate to attend the Vietnam Peace March commemoration in Washington, D.C. last October, uh, uh, where David was uh, also attending, and uh, also very happy to support the Waging Peace series of activities in, in Vietnam conducted by uh, Ron Carver and uh, Connie Field, uh, who is documenting beautiful, powerful documentary you will be able to, to see. It was premiered in Vietnam, which was very meaningful, the year of the 50, 50th year uh, of the My Lai uh, massacre. And uh, the ex this exercise that we are involved in takes place against the backdrop of the Burns and Novick documentary on the Vietnam War. Seems to me, from what I have heard through these three events, that some of the motivation for our exercise <laughs> is precisely as a, how should I say, well, as a contribution to the conversation, not to leave it only to Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, which is in danger of mainstreaming, uh, rewriting, and reinterpretation of the war. I'm speaking to you as a Vietnamese born and raised in southern Vietnam. Uh, and I traveled in my youth years with a, a Republic of Vietnam passport. But I opposed the war while I was studying in Paris and I took part in anti-war demonstrations in Paris. And I never identified with the government of the Republic of Vietnam. Because to me, the Republic of Vietnam was just an artificial creation of the major powers, and more particularly of the US, at the Geneva Accords. Uh, my allegiance is to the country of Vietnam, which has been one for several thousand years. So, um, today I, I will not uh, make a presentation. I'd like very, in the 20 minutes uh, I'm imparted, just bring to you a testimony from a Vietnamese and an analysis of how I see, I understand uh, your contribution to your own history and how it has affected also we, the Vietnamese. So the, the first point I'd like to make is that we are engaged in a crucial exercise. In French, they have a perfect word for it, uh, which is used particularly for the Jewish diaspora when they try to, to make sure that uh, future generations do not forget uh, the Holocaust. So what the, uh, in French they call travail de mémoire. In English, I will try and, uh, and say that it's a work of owning the past, your past, and your country's past. So to own the past, you need to, to know, but also to understand. And only then can you own it. 
Of course, you need to understand it, understand it in a certain way, uh, in a way that that is closer to truth, uh, as close to truth as possible. And you have to learn, and learn from both what one did right and one did wrong. I will not speak about the US, I will speak about Vietnam. For example, we Vietnamese, we have done a lot of things right, but we did a number of things wrong. All of you, especially, you know, uh, researchers, scholars of history, you will know about, you have heard about the land reform which was really a serious mistake of our party. That we have to look in the face and to understand what went wrong. The original idea of distributing land to landless farmers in itself is not a crime, is not an error, but it's how it was done, how it was not controlled, and the excesses that it led to. So in other words, you can have good intentions, but if you don't prepare properly with a proper strategy and policy and monitoring, it can lead to excesses. So we have to, uh, looking back, we have to learn the lessons from that land reform. Following the end of the war, we one major error or mistake in policy uh, that we did was the re-education camps. Now here I have to pause, pause and explain. My own brother was a captain in the uh, RVN army. And mind you, for, for those of you who have studied and who have visited, who know Vietnam, in that war, tell me which family doesn't have members on either side. You would have, you know, a, a colonel down south, a general up north. Frankly, I know several cases like that. That's part of life, you know. You are separated and on each side you live and you rise and you do things. And so within the same family, you had people on, you know, in both uh, apparatus of, of power. And at the end of the, uh, the war, which ended abruptly, you remember, very abruptly, my own brother, who was in a re-education camp for five years, when he came back, he told me, you know what, as, a, as an army man, I understand why we had to be put in re-education camps. It was a security measure. The fear was that there would be a kind of guerrilla by elements of the Saigon army trying to keep the fight and not accepting the end of the war. So keeping us confined for some time so we could not regroup, he found that as a military man, he understood the logic of it. And he told me if we had been most of us, except for those whom this side considered as having been guilty of heavy crimes, uh, then he said, we would have supported the new regime. So when I hear that, I really, really feel sad that we, we let it go on and on for several years. I think, and I've spoken publicly here and there about this. Uh, now, perhaps people, are not, people in government are not yet ready, but I think the time will come when we look back at post, you know, post-75 policies, this is one of the policies that we did wrong. 
we should we could have you know liberated most of them of the inmates much much earlier so we did ourselves wrong the third thing i i think we should learn from our past mistakes is cambodia those of you who are students of international relations you remember the the cambodia issue i support uh, you know, our move, our moving our troops into Cambodia. Because, for those of you who followed closely, you remember that the Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, were killing our civilians along the, you know, southwestern border. I mean, doing atrocities, you know. And we, at first, our government tried to, to speak sense, to negotiate with the Khmer Rouge. But though, you know, th those were crazy people and they hated us to the point that they would not stop. And so in the end, there was no other way than sending our troops. So I'm not against our sending our troops. And actually, as we defended our own security and our citizens' lives, we, we did a service to the Cambodian people because it stopped the, the genocide, the killing fields for those of you who've seen the documentary, The Killing Fields. But the fact that we stayed on, we should have stayed only one or two years to help the new regime you know, take over and stabilize. But the fact that our troops stayed on too long, I think, was a mistake. So I'm mentioning to you these three issues to say that even also for Vietnam, it's not easy to draw lessons from past mistakes. Lessons from success, that's easy. Lessons from mistakes, that's difficult. It's difficult for us, but as I will say later, it's even more difficult for you. <laughs> why? I will, the why of why it's even more difficult for, for America. So, this exercise, Travail de Mémoire, owning the past, I think is crucial for the U.S., but it's important for us too, and we need to do our own travail de mémoire. Our young people, they don't know anything. You know, they are too busy studying, starting startups, thinking technology, wanting to, to go and have a look at the U.S. and, and, uh, and Canada and, and U.K. and so on and so forth. So the war to them is very remote. Uh, it's not quite, you know, uh, something urgent, so uh, I, I am now engaged in trying to help the young people pay the, uh, the attention they need to pay to, to their country's past, because it is also their own history. Now, when, I, when we look at the past, about the good things, is I, I think about the missed opportunities between the U.S. and Vietnam. Uh, you, I, I suppose that all of you have heard about the, the letters that President Ho Chi Minh sent to, to President Truman seeking assistance from the U.S. Because, you know, Ho Chi Minh had read American history and your liberation struggle <coughs> against British colonial rule. So it sort of seemed logic a flowing logic that the U.S. would, you know, would be uh, sort of uh, prepared to to lend a positive ear to to the call for assistance from uh, Vietnam against uh, uh, French colonial rule. That did not pass to happen, and so this is the tragic uh, miss opportunity. We could have saved a war between our two countries. Anyhow, um, let me now make my uh, second uh, point, second point, which is that this uh, exercise, this work, requires a soul-searching revisiting of the notion of patriotism. I'm sure with this audience that you, see, you understand what I mean. To me, anyhow, patriotism is not allegiance 
to a transient government or to an undeserving government, as I considered the government of Saigon prior 75. To me, it was governing the southern part of Vietnam, but it was an undeserving government. I would not, you know, give my allegiance to that government. My allegiance was to my people and to my country, the whole country of Vietnam, not just, not just the south. I had relatives in the north. Second, it's allegiance to what is right and to one's conscience. And this is exactly what the object, uh, conscientious objectors on your side, the deserters, for patriotic reasons did. This is also <coughs> what you know, Hugh Thompson did in Malai. And then for us, when you start from that kind of perspective about understanding about patriotism, then for you, the enemy is not the country, not the people. The US were, are not, have never been our eternal enemy. The US as a country, the American people as a people, never, but only the US government and war machine of that time. So because of that, it was possible for us to connect and empathize with the people's groups, popular groups, women's groups, and also even uh, uh, veterans and uh, uh, GI uh, activist GI groups uh, who who were against the war, um, and because of that too, it explains why you know war crimes were committed during the Vietnam War by American troops. It is because your troops, your soldiers, were put in harm's way. I was, you know, I mean, American troops to me, the, uh, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but you, American troops during the Second World War, when the fight was clear, it was a, to defeat Nazism, you know. It was a, a legitimate cause, and so when soldiers are sent to a legitimate war for a legitimate cause, they are much, much, much less likely to perpetrate war crimes. And so, Milai and other atrocities, they, they were possible partly because of that, because uh, US soldiers were sent to the wrong war. And the same would apply to the Abu Ghraib incident. When Abu Ghraib happened in Iraq, a foreign, uh, an international journalist interviewed me, put a microphone in front of me and said, what do you think about Abu Ghraib? I didn't go into specifics or details. I just said one thing. This is what happens when you you send your troops into a war, they don't know why they, they, they take part in it. So instead of bringing the, the best in them, it brings out the worst in them. And in all of us, there's the best and the worst. And if you put them in the wrong war, in the illegitimate war, you know, the worst is bound to, to come out. On the contrary, some people have said, well, you know, uh, I, heard, I even heard one um, academic more or less implying that uh, Secretary General of the Communist Party, Leeswen, was a, a sort of a hawkish leader and he forced his people to go to continue the war. I said, you, you got it quite wrong. He didn't have to force us. It's the US bombs the constant bombing. You just have to be under the bombs 
Nobody has to tell you to take up arms to bring that war to an end, that aggression to an end. So, well, my last point will be to say something, and I venture you have to correct me again. That's my purely subjective interpretation. The kind of challenges I've mentioned occur to any country, including mine. But you, the US, you have more specific <coughs> challenges because, one, you are the first, the top superpower. And especially after the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, you were the only remaining superpower. So, you know, it has increased the so-called hubris, you know, arrogance of the superpower. And so that's why superpowers cut my country in two. And we were too weak at Geneva to force our way to, you know, the liberating the whole country. We had to accept a compromise. But this artificial partition that came from superpower hubris, I think. Uh, you know, and when I, as a diplomat at the United Nations, excuse me, uh, a general debate, uh, I heard the foreign secretary, state secretary, uh, say that the US was the indispensable nation. You know, that was after the end of the Cold War. Or I think it was the US president who said, we will act multilaterally when we can and unilaterally if we must. So it's like the pleasure of a king, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, uh, it's my uh, diplomat background, you know, that's coming back. Well, anyhow, um, second, uh, secondly, you, the U.S. people has had no experience of war and destruction. You know, f you haven't felt, seen and felt directly uh, war and destruction on your territory since civil war. And that's how I interpret the, the utter shock of, seven, of uh, uh, September 11. To you, it, you know, to, when you see what's happening in Syria and so on and so forth, what happened in Hanoi under the bombing, you know, it was, it was nearly part of that life. It was never part of, of your life since the 19th century. Next point is, I agree with what Nathan Smith said. This sanitized war means that today it's even harder for the anti-war movement to question war and for the population, the broad population, to react to the victims of war because you, you hardly see them. The victims of, you know, the soldiers that died during the Vietnam War you saw it on TV. It was brought on TV screens at home. And finally, I'm really finally, the, <laughs> <laughs> the real final, um, is just also your, the sheer size of the USA as a quasi-continent, which means in a sense that it's, you are, you, you are, you are very insular. Well, at, at least the, the average youth in the US is very insular, not very open and aware of other cultures, other peoples, especially peoples of the developing, developing world. So this is, in fact, a disadvantage that you have. Uh, you are highly educated, but culturally not so sensitive. I'm sorry to have to say that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Correct, correct me if I, you know, if I did said something that you don't agree with. Thank you. Uh, it's a little overwhelming to 
speak after that wonderful talk. Um, I spent um, about 10 years of my life um, in the anti-war movement, from 65 to 75. I did a few other things too, but that was always the most central thing that was, I was doing. Um, and it really, it really formed um, who I am today and, and uh, got me to be a historian. Um, and um, has continued, I continue to be an activist and a historian. Um, um, in this um, crowd, I don't really feel I need to give a sort of activist talk. I'm going to give more of a historian's talk, though obviously the two are closely connected in many ways. But, um, and um, I wrote this book called War Against War, which uh, Asha mentioned, uh, came out last year on the centennial of the U.S. declaration of war against Germany in 1917, and that got me thinking about, about anti-war movements in history. Um, and so I want to say a few things about that uh, too, but I also want to talk at first about some um, uh, rather interesting, maybe even remarkable parallels between uh, the two largest anti-war movements in American history. One during World War I, uh, which was larger before the United States got into the war than it was once the United States got into the war, um, in large part because the Wilson administration and the Congress and the uh, federal judges made sure that uh, it was very difficult to protest World War I. As most of you know, the Espionage Act was passed, passed during the war, the, the Sedition Act passed during the war, uh, which, eventually, which essentially made protesting the war illegal. Um, everyone who protested the war, everyone who spoke against the war was not prosecuted for that. That would have been impossible, but um, many people were. And one of the things to think about in comparison between those two movements um, is that the opponents of each war um, were countering liberal presidents, idealistic presidents, um, who most of them had earlier supported, actually, uh, and what they were doing domestically. Um, Woodrow Wilson, as uh, most of you probably know, when he called on the United States to uh, enter the war against Germany after the war uh, in Europe and Middle East had been going on for uh, almost three years, he said, the United States is not going to war for conquest. The U.S. is going to war to create a world made safe for democracy. And earlier, uh, he'd given a speech calling for a peace without victory. Um, Fifty years later, Lyndon Johnson, there with two of the leaders of the Republic of South Vietnam, who we all remember, uh, Thieu and Key, um, gave a speech in Johns Hopkins University. It sounded almost exactly like the speech Woodrow Wilson gave, uh, parts of it at least, calling on the U.S. to enter the war. He called for a peace without conquest in a world where every country can shape its own destiny. Uh, so the liberal idealism of uh, the presence uh, that the anti-war movements 100 years ago and 50 years ago um, had, went, went up against um, had an important part, I think, in uh, disillusioning people in those movements about that kind of liberal messianic internationalism. Um, because, of course, most men's messianic phrases came to seem if both hollow and really obscene um, by most anti-war critics. Um, another interesting thing is that uh, even some of the imagery of the anti-war movement during the Vietnam days used images from uh, World War I. This, of course, is a famous James Montgomery flag, uh, Uncle Sam Wants You poster, uh, repurposed uh, 55, uh, 52 years later uh, to be an anti-Vietnam War poster. Um, and also, both movements 100 years ago and 50 years ago um, flourished, I think, in part because they attracted experienced organizers from other movements. We often forget, when people study social movements, people involved in social movements, how much each social movement depends on the experiences of, the rhetoric of, um, and the individuals from other movements uh, who enter uh, that anti-war movement, usually after they've been involved in other movements first. Not always, but often the most experienced um, and most effective organizers are those who have experience in other movements. Um, that was true, as we know, in the 1960s where many of the most talented anti-war organizers came from other movements on the broad left against poverty, uh, for civil liberties, for nuclear disarmament, uh, and especially for black liberation. Um, they had learned to define, we had learned to define our politics as a deeply moral undertaking in those earlier movements, before we got in the anti-war movement. Um, 
Muhammad Ali, uh, famously, of course, um, uh, applied for conscientious objection, saying, I ain't got no claw with him, Viet Cong, no Viet Cong ever called me N-word. Um, and this helped to forge a very tight connection, I think, between people who have been in the black freedom movement and in the anti-war movement. Earlier, um, you know, we heard about Julian Bond, of course, uh, leader of SNCC, uh, who gets uh, denied his seat in the Georgia state legislature because SNCC opposed the war in Vietnam. Um, and so a, a passionate internationalism was taken for granted in the 1960s, as it was 100 years ago. Um, 100 years ago, some of the leaders of that movement, very quickly, um, were prominent socialists. The American Socialist Party was the only, one of the two major socialist parties in the world to oppose uh, the entry of their nation uh, to World War I. The other one was uh, Italy. Uh, there are anarchists like Emma Goldman, feminists like uh, Crystal Eastman um, and uh, Jane Addams, and uh, many progressive senators from both parties. Uh, Robert La Folla, probably the most important of them. Um, so, as the great community organizer Saul Alinsky used to say, I'm paraphrasing here, if you want to organize something, first find people who have organized something else. Because, <laughs> um, you know, we have this romantic sense sometimes that people just, you know, wake up one day and say, this is wrong, I'm going to do something about it. Well, people do that, that's true. But uh, usually the people who help to convince them that something is wrong are people who already have been involved in social justice movements uh, before. Um, now, we, uh, this is a point that uh, was touched on earlier, but I want to emphasize it. Um, why did the earlier movement uh, against World War I fail? and the one that we were all involved in, uh, well, not all of us, but most of us, um, 50 years ago, uh, succeed. Um, interestingly, it's very likely that the US intervention in World War I was actually less popular before the declaration of war in April 1917 than the US intervention in Vietnam was until the Tet Offensive uh, in you know, this winter of 1968 by which time, of course, as you know, over 500,000 American troops went to Vietnam. So actually mobilization against World War I, the U.S. entry into World War I, had gone farther, uh, even before the U.S. actually did declare war than was true uh, in the Vietnam War movement, the Vietnam movement. Um, and uh, the reason why, the main reason, I think, why the anti-war movement 100 years ago did not succeed was that the war was so short and was victorious um, for the United States. More Americans died in combat in World War I than in Vietnam. Uh, but the majority of them died in one battle, the Battle of the Mouz Argonne, um, which began in September 1918 and ended on the Armistice Day, uh, November 1918. Um, so the contrast to the Vietnam War, I think, is striking, uh, because it took about three years after Johnson began escalating the war before a plurality of Americans turned against the war, according to public opinion polls. And even though um, all honor to people who were my heroes at the time and still my heroes, uh, people who were in the military and opposed the war, um, who knows what would have happened if uh, the National Liberation Front had not mounted the Tet Offensive, which of course, as we know, was terribly destructive of the, uh, of the troops of the NLF. Um, but nevertheless, as you know, the publicity for that war um, uh, helped to turn, I think, a majority of Americans against the war, I believe, for the first time. Um, so in the end, and this is a point that was made earlier, the anti-war movement succeeded because the Vietnamese kept fighting, kept fighting US forces to a stalemate. I wish it hadn't taken so many deaths uh, for American politicians finally to give up the effort, but sadly, uh, it did. Um, now, a second theme I want to touch on is why um, other people talk about this too. Why so few Americans know about uh, the movement against the war in Vietnam? Uh, in comparison to all the uh, Americans who have learned one way or another about the black freedom movement, um, <coughs> about uh, the feminist movement, um, even about the, uh, the movement for gay and lesbian liberation. Um, 
There were monuments for all those movements. Stonewall you know, Bar in Greenwich Village is a monument, uh, in effect, to LGBT movement. Um, and of course, uh, there are civil rights museums uh, around the country, some very wonderful ones, and uh, the one in Memphis, for example. Uh, and of course, there is a, a monument on the mall to uh, one, of the, one of the great leaders of the Black Freedom Movement, uh, not the only one, Dr. King. Um, but it's going to be a while before we have a monument <laughs> to the anti-war movement. Um, and, and this reflects, I'm afraid to say, uh, perhaps I'm wrong, and there's a lot of people here who have written wonderful books about aspects of the anti-war movement in the Vietnam era, reflects what we talked about before here today, is the, uh, the, the absence of uh, recognition of how important that movement was uh, in helping to end the war um, and in linking up with other social movements, uh, which, which most Americans have learned to, at least if, if only grudgingly, uh, think were good ideas, like the Black Freedom Movement and the Women's Movement. Um, there's still only one survey of opposition to the war in Vietnam, right? Tom Wells's book, not a great book, but uh, people, there's, there's, it's time for you know, two or three other great surveys, um, I think. Um, my book's the only uh, book of synthesis of opposition to World War I, uh, which was the other great anti-war movement. Um, and I think it, it's that neglect by scholars um, which has uh, something to do with uh, the terrible treatment of the anti-war movement in the Burns and Novick series that uh, people have talked about. Um, uh, they could not have made a sort of both sides were, you know, equally uh, interesting and honorable uh, about the Black Freedom Movement, you know. Uh, nobody was going to say, well, Bull Connor was doing his best, you know. Um, <laughs> he was wrong, but, you know, we have to sympathize with him. Um, nobody would do that. Um, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so how do? We, but, but as an historian, I have to try to explain why um, there's this relative neglect. I know it's relative neglect. People here have written wonderful books uh, about this. But um, in general, anti-war movements in America are kind of the orphan of American uh, of scholarship for social movements. After all, the United States has been at war uh, through most of its history if you count the wars against Native Americans, which you have to count. And in fact, there's been opposition of one kind or another to most of those wars. Um, so why you know, so little understanding and recognition of those movements? Some of it, I think, has to do with the reverence for the military, which has always run deep in US history. Um, uh, I, I tell my students, you know, I ask them, how many American presidents uh, became president because of their military service? Um, and they, you know, they don't know much history usually when they're, they're first year students. They say, oh, this is it was Eisenhower and I guess Grant. In fact, 10 American presidents, a quarter of those who were elected in their own right, won office largely or partially on the strength of their military exploits. Um, and um, another reason, I think, is that um, the study of, of peace movements, the study of anti-war movements, um, sort of part of the history of diplomacy and the history of war, which has been dominated for most of its history um, by scholars who focus on um, powerful men in and out of uniform who made decisions to prepare for uh, and fight and then negotiate and end to armed conflicts. Citizens who challenge their decisions seem marginal to that larger history. And also something else which is uncomfortable for those who are opposed to war is that wars in America, at least, have often uh, accelerated uh, reforms that those who opposed the war supported. Women's suffrage, for example, triumphed in part as a result of the role women played in World War I. The Black Freedom Movement got a huge boost in numbers and influence as a result of World War II. Um, so there's, there's other examples I can give as well. So that has not happened with the Iraq War and uh, uh, the Afghan War, um, but it has happened with earlier ones. Um, how much time? Five minutes, okay. <laughs> I thought I had 25 minutes. Got to stop at living here. Um, um, I think the very nature of anti-war movements plays a part in this neglect as well. Um, uh, anti-war movements are not like other movements, if you think about it. Um, 
Other movements are long movements. There's a long women's movement, a long LGBT movement, a long environmental movement, a long uh, civil rights movement. Um, uh, they can take a long time to grow. They can have setbacks. They can, uh, different generations of people can sign on to them uh, and leave them, and the movement keeps going forward and often keeps making gains. Anti-war movements aren't like that. Anti-war movements, at least massive ones that have much success, have to grow quickly. They have to stop a war that's already going on or to stop a war that's about to happen, as in World War I, as in the huge demonstrations right before the US invaded uh, Iraq in 2003, um, heard about before. Um, so anti-war activists um, are always with us, and all of us are anti-war activists, or most of us at least, but you know, uh, most people don't know what we're doing. Uh, unless there's a war that we're opposing, unless there's a war we're opposing and being at all successful in opposing. So that's, uh, I think, a problem too. Finally, I want to say a few words about why no mass anti-war movement today. There's been some comments on that. Um, and, um, you know, there's you know, many courageous soldiers uh, uh, who've, who've tried to oppose those wars and have in many ways. We heard from two of them this morning, of course, Nathan and Jonathan. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting about the wars that have gone on now um, is that Americans don't um, have stopped supporting uh, them, according to public opinion polls, would like the United States to leave, but they're not all that you know, uh, interested in doing anything about it. Um, there have been anti-war demonstrations, of course. Um, this is one of the largest ones in 2007, one of the last largest ones over a decade ago in Washington, D.C. Um, but part of the problem, I think, is, again, to go back to the sense of morality, which drives people into social movements. Um, when I and other people in this room were opposing the Vietnam War, we had a very clear sense that if we were successful and the United States withdrew, the Vietnamese people would control their own country. And we were all for that. Um, you know, some of us chanted, you know, Ho Ho Chi Minh, NLF is going to win. <laughs> and wore, you know, NLF flags on our lapels, uh, which might not have been the best idea to convince some Americans. But anyway, we did it, and we felt proud about it. But today, you know, I don't know of any Americans who oppose the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq who would say, yeah, sure, let ISIS win, let the Taliban win, you know, no problem, you know. Uh, so, Morally, it's a more complicated case. I'm not saying the United States should stay in those countries. That's a different argument. But to convince a lot of Americans that it's a mistake for us to still to be there, you have to make a more complicated argument about innocent civilians dying from drone strikes that are you know, launched by people sitting in an office in Northern Virginia, near where I live, uh, and, and elsewhere. But it's not the same. You know? So there's a, a lack of a moral internationalism, I think, among progressive people. Uh, like pretty much all of us in this room, uh, I believe, which was there 50 years ago, which is not there today. Um, Michael Walzer, political theorist who used to co-edit Dissent with me, uh, has written, the default position of the left is the best foreign policy is a good domestic policy. I think that's true for many people, not just on the left, but on the right as well. Um, in some ways, that's what Donald Trump was trying to get at when he said about America first and um, uh, do things only for for, for the United States. Um, so I um, want to end um, with one of my favorite, uh, take a little bit one of my favorite anti-war documents of all time in America, which is The Moral Equivalent of War by great philosopher William James, written in 1910 uh, before World War I. And one of the reasons it's a great document is because he hated war. Um, he said war made history into a bath of blood. Uh, but he was very conscious of why it was so difficult uh, to mount opposition to war. Um, and, um, and he said in the first line of that uh, essay, the war against war is going to be no holiday excursion or camping party. And you know he didn't know the half of it. Uh, but the point is that in order, I think, to build uh, an anti-war movement today, an anti-militarist movement today, uh, all the th things we've been talking about and that we would dearly like to have, we have to take very seriously the reasons why, um, uh, reasons, uh, why those movements have had a hard time getting off their feet uh, and why there have been so few of those movements in, in American history. So sorry to leave you with a, a sober <laughs> message like that. Uh, the task is nevertheless 
you know, as vitally important as ever. Um, but um, I think the only way it's going to happen uh, is, again, if, and someone said this earlier, I think, if uh, those of us who are trying to build an anti-war and anti-militarist movement do link up with other movements already there, because that's the only way it's ever happened in the past. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe we'll take a few uh, together, so, and then the next, the one next to you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm David Zeiger. Um, uh, Chris, I really appreciate uh, your points about um, Forrest Gump and the whole uh, kind of the onslaught in the in the 20 years, 30 years after the Vietnam War of uh, from Hollywood, from, I mean, Forrest Gump was the tip of the iceberg um, that really culminated in the, um, the massive spitting stories that came out in, in, in the context of the, uh, the first invasion of Iraq. And just in, in terms of the connection between Vietnam and today and the war, the, the, there's general connections, but there is very specific ones. And I think the spitting stories are so central to that. Um, Ken Burns, six months before that series was on TV, he was all over the news, you know, he was, uh, he was doing interviews, he was, time after time after time, he said, my central goal with this series is to make sure that never again will American soldiers be denigrated by the American public. That was his goal. And any, any, Every documentary film, just like every narrative film, you have kind of one central theme you're trying to get across. And if you look at all of the things that happened in that series, with, you know, with how he depicted students, how he depicted veterans, everything, it was all with that one goal in mind. And it was not out of ignorance. Ken Burns is not dumb. He, he knew. He knew about the GI anti-war movement. He, you know, he knew about the veterans movement. So it was a very conscious thing that went on. And, how that relates to today, to me, was, was, was very much illustrated in, the, in the, that first, uh, the, the demonstration that Jonathan spoke of uh, against the, the invasion of Iraq. Largest demonstration in the history of the world, history of the US, before the invasion. I remember sitting in meetings, planning those demonstrations, and people including, and, and unfortunately mainly, people out of the 60s saying, We've got to be very careful not to make the same mistake that we made in the 60s. We don't target the soldiers. I mean, this, this has become the dogma of what happened. And what killed the anti-war movement against Iraq was, in a nutshell, American soldiers were now in harm's way. And once that happened, this mythology that comes directly out of the Vietnam War took hold and, and had a, a massive... Uh, chilling effect on, in, on opposition to that war, and I think that's gone on since. And I think that was, by the way, that banner was carried very proudly by Barack Obama. So this is, a, this is, this is huge. <laughs> can, can, I just, can, I, can I make yeah. a comment in response? Sure. sure. Yeah. Just since it's, uh, I know you want to get a couple, but uh, I agree with everything you said. I mean, the, acts, the, the, sort of the, the, the wisdom was simply to support the troops. When no, no one said in that documentary or even in much public discourse the obvious thing that you could sort of tick off in a couple minutes. Obviously, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Vietnam are very different countries with different histories and cultures. However, in terms of American policy, once again, as in Vietnam, uh, we are uh, engaged in wars under false pretext. Uh, we're sending hundreds of thousands of troops uh, to far distant lands where they're widely perceived as invaders or occupiers where they're given the impossible task of propping up unpopular governments that don't have the broad support of their own people, where they're uh, engaged in a brutal counterinsurgency uh, that guarantees um, widespread destruction of the land and the civilian population. Uh, and you know, once again, uh, as in Vietnam, uh, we're simply not achieving our stated objectives. And persisting in the war, again, long after the American public has concluded that the war is at least mistaken, if not uh, immoral. So, I mean, that, I mean, that didn't take too long to say, but no one 
says it in that film and in much other uh, places. Go ahead. Um, I'm Bill Earhart, and I'm one of those veterans that Burns and Novick put in their series. Um, and I can tell you that a whole hell of a lot ended up on the cutting room floor. Uh, John McAuliffe can tell you that I spent uh, six years biting my fingernails waiting to see what the hell they did with me. And, and by last June, when Burns was saying that bullshit, I was apoplectic. Poor John was, I was driving him crazy with, oh, fuck, what have I done? I've been, they're going to make a jackass out of me. Um, it turned out to be not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, and I won't, I won't get into detail because probably there's a million people here who would like to talk for two hours as I would. Uh, but, but the one thing they did, you have to understand that Burns and Novick, Bank of America is not going to underwrite a scathing indictment of American imperialism. It just ain't going to happen. Um, there is good information out there, lots of it. Chris has written some of it. Uh, David's film is brilliant, but David's film isn't shown on, on public television. Um, there's a reality to what's going to get out there, and the one thing that I, I'm glad I participated in is that I've had, because I've been in it, I've been invited to speak and write New York Times, NPR, um, all sorts of outlets. I was just doing it last night, which is why I got here late today, where I can tell people exactly what I think. And I sat on a stage with Lynn Novick and told her I was the anti-war movement and I wasn't spitting on myself and calling myself a baby killer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Can we go Sure. Yeah, just really quick, you know, about the Burns Novick series. Um, I asked my students, in every class, you know, since it came out, you know, how many people saw it? Not one student <laughs> saw it. So in some ways, I think, you know, Burns Novick, you know, we care a lot about it. You know, I'm not sure, you know, I think it was pretty much uh, our generation, maybe people a little younger who really were absorbed by it. But uh, younger generation, maybe that's a sad thing in some ways. The younger generation just, uh, and these are smart history students at a fancy elite school, you know, it might as well not have happened. Did you ask them what books they read instead? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. If yeah, I can my name, ask for my name is Ron Schneck. I'm, I'm a Vietnam vet and a long time uh, cat affiliated with, with VPAW. Just like other people here, real, just real quickly, and I apologize to everybody here. Uh, I tried to watch the, the Burns thing also, and I apologize because I tried to watch it sober. If that ever happens again, I'm going to be seriously <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> But there is, on a serious note, there's, there's a number of things, and I hope it's also really touched on uh, tomorrow in the, with the GI press and the, and the thing on the GI movement. And that is the internationalism that existed along with the heroic struggle of the Vietnamese people cannot be underestimated. And, and, and it's so far, in some ways, it's been left out. Uh, I came of age after Vietnam. You had African liberation struggles. You had the tricontinental. You had the living memory of Che. Uh, I mean, there was this, there was struggle. There was there was a real vision of other ways to organize society and look at the world that is now what ISIS. You know, the, the a caliphate from the from the eighth eighth century or something like that. And developing that vision, that's, that's a real difficult struggle. And it's a struggle that has to be taken on. And that's one of the things that we are faced with, both young, young and old, in terms of striving. One other thing that I want to say, real quickly, and, this is, and that is when you have radical soldiers, men and women, who revolt against their military, and I would draw a very strong line with the struggles of, of, of national liberation struggles in the United States and around the world. I actually see huge connections. There's a reason, there are cop, there are cop, communists, excuse me. <laughs> there are Confederate uh, iconographic statues in San Diego. Harriet Tubman, Denmark, VC, you cannot find that in any, History books. You're not going to find 
soldiers who revolt against the U.S. military, whether it's going back to the Revolutionary War, the Indian Wars, to now. They're going to try to write very powerful institutions. They're going to write that stuff out of history and try to keep that as blank, as blank as possible. You know, so... I think we have... Yeah, I, I had a question for Michael, because I thought you brought up a really good point right at the tail end. Well, you brought up a lot of good points, but at the tail end, because um, it's something I've thought about a lot. You drew a distinction between when you were talking about Vietnam and now, because when you were part of the Vietnam movement, uh, it's, it's not inconceivable, the alternative to losing the war and having the government become what it is now in Vietnam, which is a unified, you know, it's still the Communist Party obviously governing there. And that's obviously worked out in most ways fine in terms of U.S. foreign policy. But you pointed out that's not a viable alternative with a Taliban-run state in Afghanistan or an ISIS-run state in Iraq. And whatever, I, I guess something that I can't get, get past on my own intellectual level is you can't really get past that until we have a foreign policy solution for those problems. Now, I would argue that we're not even trying to do that anymore, to figure that out. Now we're just using the military as a band-aid to keep bombing. But I'm just curious, like, what, if, you, if anybody on the panel or anybody in this room has any ideas of how to deal with that, because I think that's a really good salient point you made. Maybe we can take one more question here at the center. I saw him. Any other questions? Is there any answer for it? Yeah. Well, what I would say is um, let's look at the record of American foreign policy, you know, since World War II. And the assumption that we have to be the policemen of the world because, in the absence of that, uh, anarchy and greater chaos would reign. I, I just think the record itself sh shows that where we've gone, we've been more destabilizing and created more anarchy. It's not to make a brief for the Taliban or ISIS. I'm just saying, you know, um, there may be other solutions that are closer to home. Um, and I, I said, look, we haven't tried that. Yeah, I mean, I, I disagree with Chris some of that. I mean, I think it's not enough for people, uh, anti-militarists, people in the peace movement, to just say, you know, don't do anything. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think multilateral, multinational uh, efforts. I'm not sure. What I think about the first Gulf War. Actually, I, I'm, I've, I've gone back and forth on that. But at least that was an attempt to be multinational. And you know, Saddam Hussein had no right to take over Kuwait. You know, I think that's pretty clear by you know, any reckoning. I don't think. But um, anyway, let, let me get that. But I'm just saying. I, I, I'm, I, th I think it's. I think. I, th I think it's a serious problem when you have the most powerful military nation on earth especially run by, you know, uh, the worst president um, I know of um, and the worst party backing him up I know of. Uh, I don't want Trump to do anything, that's for damn sure. But at the um, same time, you know, I think uh, we have to be willing to say that, you know, unless you want to say the military should be disbanded. You know, the, the military is going to be there and, well, okay. <laughs> but, but that's not going to happen very soon. Uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, people like us have to have a foreign policy. And, you know, the safest foreign policy, Michael Walzer quoted before, says, support our friends. So, like, for example, in Iraq, there's this group of Kurdish uh, militants, uh, YPG, I think. Their women fight with them. Their politics is kind of anarchist, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, I think they're great, but, you know, that, that's not going to be the future of, of, of Iraq, uh, or even of Kurdistan, for that matter. So, all I'm saying is it's, it's, it's a problem. We, we can't just assume it's not a problem. If I may on, on, uh, on this last point, um, this is my, my own personal opinion. When, um, when the Twin Towers were attacked, I, following US diplomacy and geo strategy, I thought they are going to react immediately. They are going to strike immediately. Then I was pleasantly surprised that they did not. So I thought, oh, this time they are thinking 
<laughs> you know, it's not a trigger happy, you know. So I thought, oh, well, I mean, they're thinking. And I thought they were thinking what? Well, why did they, and afterwards they knew that many Saudis were taking part. I mean, if they had kept their heads cool, they would not have attacked Afghanistan. Now, not to mention Iraq and so on and so forth. So I think that today we mention ISIS, Taliban, and this and that. They are, in a sense, the consequences of an absence, absence of proper, you know, uh, geostrategic thinking. And so now we see the U.S. being all over, trying to to sort of uh, stop the fires that they they kindle themselves, and they can't stop them. And so, very very frankly. That is also why, why it's so difficult for the broad public uh, in the US, added to what I said, that you can't see the, the dead. In, during the Vietnam War, you saw the dead, our dead, your dead, all over the place. You know? But now it's very far away, we don't see it. And on top of that, it's very abstract because of you know, uh, the pretext of uh, anti-terrorism. In other words, my take on this is the, the US superpower should rethink the limits of its power. It's overstretched. It's doing things that it can't handle afterwards. And who's paying the price? The people. My personal opinion is that today, you know, you, you read, you listen to the United Nations, since the intervention in Iraq, there have been several hundred thousand civilian deaths. Not necessarily because of the US troops, but because you enlisted the Pandora's box, you know, of terrorism. In other words, the terrorism, the terrorist attacks that we see today, the pretext is the US intervention. You see, and so when you look at what's going on in the world, especially in the Middle East, what is at fault? First is U.S. diplomacy and geostrategy. Only next, the U.S. military. So I don't think we should say, you know, this is a problem of the military. It's a problem at the very top, at the very heart of the command, and the command sh should always be civilian. There's a problem, you have a problem there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Skip Delano, and I was a Vietnam vet and active in anti war movement, GI anti war movement. And I want to sort of address what Michael said. And one is to say that our military, our military authorities never ever celebrated soldiers who descended during the Vietnam War. They did everything to suppress that and stop that. And after the war is over, they're certainly not going to go back and say, hey, guys, write histories about it. We want everybody to know about this. Mm -hmm. And they certainly today don't want people to know about it. Whereas the women's movement, civil rights movement, those are things that won great victories and are celebrated today. But they're never, our military, our government is not going to want you to write a history that they're going to spread all their, our youth in America. That's not going to happen. However, I don't think we should miss one important lesson out of the GI movement. There are Iraqi vets, there are Afghani vets here today. Those guys, I'm not wrong, spoke out when they were in the military against the war at that time. They marched against the war at that time. They're here today and calling on their brothers and sisters to do the same today and oppose U.S. aggression abroad. If you go back and you look before Vietnam, soldiers did not question their government, period. There was no dissent within the military before the Vietnam War. It just did not exist. You criticize a president, you could get court-martialed and put in jail. Well, that changed during the Vietnam War. We could not only, after Lieutenant or Howe marched against uh, the war, I guess in 65, he was court-martialed, but it ended after that. People were, uh, uh, you know, court-martialed for various kinds of things in different kinds of ways. However, what we did establish is the right of soldiers men and women to oppose the war, to criticize their president, 
criticize military authority, that has changed. That is a victory for the people everywhere. And so that's a good thing. It's one thing we should not forget here when we're talking about this period of looking back. And any comments you have on it, I'd love to hear it. Uh, really quick, I, think it's, I, think, I think it's a great point. Um, but just a little corrective, the government doesn't stop you from writing history. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, and, and you know, what the point I was making is that most historians, as Chris knows very well, most you know, most historians today, um, you know, support the politics we're talking about here. You know, they could write the histories that they wanted to, but it's, but it's, uh, you know, there, there are reasons why um, most, of them, most of them don't. Because, you know, because again, it's, you know, it's, it's, more, it's more complicated because, you know, they have to get into the question of what about, you know, the, the troops who are fighting those wars, fighting unjust wars. And uh, one of the great things about this conference is, you know, uh, it makes clear that they were central, those who opposed that war. Uh, but, but as Chris said, most people don't know that. Most people, you know, I show in my class on, on when I teach about the 60s, I always show that, that clip um, from, uh, you know, April 24, 71 of, of, of vets you know, throwing their, their medals over the, over the fence of the Capitol. And my students say, what? <laughs> it's, like, it's like this was, you know, that's probably, in, in the evaluations of the course, they say, that film was the best thing about the course because nobody ever told me that, you know. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Usher apologizes. He had to go to the dinner of the president of the university. So, so that's a good excuse. But a couple of, uh, let's go with the lady here, then Jonathan, and then James over here. Well, if we're talking about the role of the military in the anti war movement, I think it's very important for us to realize that they had brought, the vets brought something back very special, which was a sense of collectivity. And I went to UMass Amherst, I was, but I started off being for the war as a kid. So you learn by people telling you, the people who've been around before, like you said, the little ladies with sneakers, probably younger than me now, that helped us with Women's Strike for Peace, whatever, get our high school buses to go against the war. But at UMass Amherst, tuition was free, rent was cheap enough, so VVAW had homes, and they accepted in the guys who were still for the war or mis misguided. They were armed, which made the movement a little bit difficult, but they gave a sense of collectivity because of their experience in the, in the war, I think, and a sense of brotherhood that did impact the anti-war movement as a whole. I think that's a gift about collectivity. It's a problem we have now because we live in, nobody's mentioned it, a neoliberal capitalist world where it's all about individuals articulating with the market. It's very hard to get people to come together in groups, but that was something that veterans have an experience of groupness that, that was very important. The other point is the issue of racism. I, we know it wasn't just about Martin Luther King and um, Malcolm X and particularly um, and Muhammad Ali, but every kid, 16 and 17, who heard about Woodstock, heard Jimi Hendrix lament in that national anthem. And that's just one example of the African American contribution to criticizing the war. And that criticism in the ranks of the soldiers came home. It was African American soldiers who talked about imperialism and colonialism. I didn't know those words. What was my thing? And I bet many of us were working class kids. First, we supported the war wholeheartedly because our sons and brothers were going. Who these kids get, you know, going to strike? What's that? Then when we came against the war, simply to bring our boys home. It was a gift of the African American and VVAW soldiers that taught us about a lot more. I think we need to, even though the movements, you may say, the, the, the ranks of black and white soldiers were separate in the movement, the cross fertilization, first of all, it was drugs, it was African American parlance, it was African American music, and it came home to every American family across all 50 states. And that is a gift of the African American people to the anti war movement, and that is very minimal in the histories of the anti war movement. That and the collectivity, which I think we need to look at if we want to bring young people into any kind of activism, because they basically articulate with the internet and social media, etc. They don't know about meetings, which suck, but. You have to have them, you know? So that, and the other thing is, I want to thank you all for this thing. Very important because, what did you talk Philip say? A long memory makes the best radicals. So, that and activists, forever activists. That's a great statement. I just echo one part of it. Racial cohesion and unity uh, may, may have fallen apart a bit in rear areas, in, the, in bases, on bases. But uh, an act of combat refusal in the field requires that very, the very unity that keeps you alive when you're actually fighting. It takes, it requires that same solidarity to resist fighting. And that is cross-racial. And, right. and, uh, and people felt yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dave, real quickly, I just want to say, uh, this microphone is off, I'll just 
I, I just want to say that I, I think we, I think we got to be careful that we don't validate the dominant narrative, if you will, by talking about our movements uh, in separate lanes. Um, and and, and uh, there's, there's a term we use, and, and it's just not coming to me. Um, but in terms of these separate lanes, in other words, that cross fertilization, intersectionality. In other words, and I'm, I'm, I'm adding, actually adding what you stated. I mean, you, you, when we talk. So in other words, and Mike, I, I was, you, you sparked this thought in me that we shouldn't. I would challenge not to say women's movement, you know, LGBT movement, civil rights movement, anti-war movement. If, if, if we talk about a military budget, what does a military budget do to a domestic economy? What does a mass military budget mean for the building of schools and local communities? What does a mass military budget mean for those who are still locked in reservations today? What does a mass military budget mean to hospital closing, if we talk in that narrative, not just about ending the war, which is the, the most vital piece, but why do we want to end the war? Is it just because we believe in the ideal of peace? Or do we believe what peacemaking does to make a community holistic, to actually feed, clothe, and house people? I mean, this is the type of language, I'm done, David, that Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson talked about in the 80s. Not, you know, I know how we think about Jesse maybe today, but he talked about cutting the military budget in half to actually accomplish a lot of these priorities. I'm done. <laughs> Hello, is this working? David, come in. Um, Josh in the back. Two things. One from Michael. Uh, there is a book, there's another book called The War Against War. And it's by uh, Hans Friedrich. And he set up a museum that the Nazis kept on running from place to place. And maybe we could learn from the war against war and create internet memes using the kind of montage that uh, Friedrich used, which was, you know, have the Kaiser stepping on duckboards that are covered in blood. Underneath, you have a whole bunch of dead bodies. The other thing I wanted to bring up was, and I'm not sure if anyone's looked at this material except me, um, but there's a whole group of, there was a serious effort in the GI press to come to an understanding of what does the end of the draft mean and who would fight the wars. And there's a whole <coughs> series of articles, most of which in retrospect turned out to be true, of where is America going to fight its next wars and who is going to fight it. And the areas they said were Central America and the Middle East. And the people they said were going to fight it were, were, were servicemen and reservists. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting sub-theme that begins around 1972 and sort of peters out around 1975 and is worth looking into. But if there's someone can come up with some Friedrich internet memes for Facebook, yeah, that would be cool. Make pro-war people vomit in their breakfast. Okay, yeah, David is next and then Josh. Um, okay. I, I can here. speak without a microphone. Um, I, I never speak for two hours. I'm a university professor, so 50 minutes is usually how long I'm <laughs> um, A lot of good points that we need that need to be followed up. More one that's not been mentioned, except in Michael's talk, is the US military has been used to justify a bunch of progressive social policies in American history. The US military has been used to justify spending on education, Spending on educate, uh, spending on infrastructure. I went to school on the National Defense Student Loan. I studied poetry. Um, um, progressive social policy, ultimately and half-heartedly on race and on gay rights. And the United States has been very weak in developing progressive social movements to do that, absent the military. And that's a challenge for activists. Um, there's one thing Josh. about the microphones. Yeah. The live feed can't hear. Yeah, Josh. Yeah. 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 Who's the last? Josh. Hey, I want to go back to the question of uh, the opposition to the war link to the the ISIS that it's Islamic fundamentalism and all this. First of all, a government of Christian fundamentalism that we live under now has no moral authority to judge anybody else in the world. <laughs> This is a, and, and uh, there was a lot of op there was a lot of outrage when you had uh, newsreel of uh, ISIS uh, cutting the throat of uh, 
of their uh, prisoners of war and how horrific and horrible that was. And while you can agree with that, the annihilation of 250,000 people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in an instant is a little bit different. So um, people who are getting ready to have a moral, uh, that, that this country in any way, this government in any way, can be the moral arbiter of what goes on in the world is insane. I just um, I, um, I hope you didn't um, hear me as saying that I thought it was fine for the U.S. to be in, in Iraq because of ISIS. What I was saying is, uh, or if you're asking the Taliban, the, 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 the problem is that, uh, again, if you are asking people to devote um, a large part of their lives to opposing those wars, uh, they have to have convincing arguments about the question, what happens if we're not there? And to me, um, our side hasn't come up with, you know, uh, very uh, convincing arguments yet. I, I think we should be out of those countries uh, tomorrow, but do I feel great about what will happen when we leave? Uh, no, the people control their own countries and they'll keep fighting with each other. Um, the way people are in Syria, not, hopefully not that bad, but, um, you know, I think it's also important for us to think, you know, I don't want to start a whole argument here, but, you know, um, America's not responsible for everything bad in the world, <laughs> you know. Um, people have agency, you know, and these movements that ISIS is part of, Taliban is part of, Al-Qaeda was part of, you know, that's a movement, yes, it was partly, um, th those movements grew in part because of American imperialism, that's certainly true, but, but people have an ideology they feel very strongly about, and, um, and it's a, you know, and, and people, you know, believed, and they still believe, you know, that, that it's a better way to run uh, the world the way their interpretation of Islam, you know, uh, goes. So I think it's, it's, I think it's wrong, it's in some ways condescending for people on the left like us to say, you know, everything, you know, ISIS and, and Taliban and all that, you know, happened because um, of American policy. Yes, American policy helped them to grow, that's certainly true. Without the invasion of Iraq, they probably wouldn't have grown as much, but those movements have a longer history as well, just as all movements in this country have a longer history. Um, and, and we can't just assume that somehow, if America wasn't doing these bad things, you know, these things wouldn't exist. Uh, Paul. I'm Paul Lauder. Um, I'm old enough, older than most people here, that I, work, I started working for the American Friends Service Committee, the Peace uh, uh, Area, whatever it's called, in 1963. There was not a peace movement in 1963. There were some peace organizations like the AFSC, like Women's Strike for Peace, and, and so forth. There was not a focus for it. There was the same nuclear policy committee focused on, on nuclear policy. Dr. Spock was worried. Um, by April of 1965, you had the first large demonstration um, uh, led by SDS in, in Washington. It, it speaks to Michael's point, I think it was your point, uh, about how um, peace action grows quickly and has to. And between 1963 and 1965, it, it did precisely that. But it also it, it tells us something. Wherever we are right now, and I think we could have a good deal of disagreement about, uh, about that, we don't know what will be the case, uh, what will be the situation two years from now. And I think people have to be both encouraged uh, and uh, have their eyes open about the uh, possibility of the growth of movement, uh, movements uh, and, and the embrace of the errors that we, we made uh, and continue to make now. Uh, and in a way, uh, what's going on politically in Washington may provide precisely that sort of opportunity. Remains to be seen. But having lived through that process in two years, and, and uh, a few more years after that. I want to be positive about it. Uh, I, I don't want us to, to, to sink into that despair that one has, well, we, we just don't have it together, yes. Yeah, we don't have it together, but, but we did get it together. We did get it together, and I, I really have the sense that we will again. Yeah, just, that's a great statement. One follow-up to that, because I share that view and often tell my students, 
that history isn't inevitable, and that, for example, no one in the early 80s was predicting that within the decade the Soviet Union was going to implode, or that, uh, uh, that Nelson Mandela w was going to be released from prison and become the president of South Africa. The unpredictable, surprising things do happen. So. Um, John, maybe one more, one or two more questions, and then we'll let the panel wrap up. John. Okay. Um, about both. <laughs> Stereo. Oh, <laughs> Speak out of both sides of your mouth, John. John Kevin, um, I, I just want to. Uh, I don't want to let the U.S. off the hook on this, uh, even as much as Michael did. Um, with regard to Afghanistan, the United States intervened between 1978 and, and 1990 to create a uh, Islamic fundamentalist Sorry. resistance inside Afghanistan to overthrow a progressive secular government, and succeeded in doing it as part of their, a part of the U.S. ruling class war against the Soviet Union. So they created this uh, Al-Qaeda and Taliban and all of that. They allowed that, they created a situation that allowed it to grow. U.S. policy inside Iraq, following the rise of the uh, resistance movement, when the U.S. saw, when the strategists of the U.S. saw that they weren't able to defeat the guerrillas on the ground to, by directly fighting them, was to promote the fighting between the Iraqis, be, by, and they instigated that kind of fighting and promoted it so that Shia and Sunni uh, groups would fight against each other. So I think we can't let the U.S. off the hook on any of this. And there's no reason, certainly, uh, we can't say what kind of, you know, a great government is going to follow in Afghanistan. But what we can do all the time is say the U.S. got to get out of there. Okay, and, and, and okay, just one other point quickly. The uh, people talking about how we're unable to get our story out. When it's not like it's just because we're doing things wrong, or there is, it's very consciously in the service of those who rule the country. It's not a conspiracy, it's a class that rules this country. And they do not want there to be that people should learn that there was a military resistance that there was a popular resistance during the Vietnam War that helped the Vietnamese people who were the main fighters in that war and who had a lot of allies at the time that, that enabled them to keep fighting in a very powerful way that were, that were effective in doing it. They purposely distorted. It. It's not just an accident and it's not just because we blunder. So that's what we should keep in mind, I think. That's it. Okay. Well, let's let the panelists uh, if we can, uh, one last round in terms of final comments or uh, reactions to any of the comments. So maybe Chris, if you wanted to start first. Uh, the only thought I had inspired by the great comment about right after 9-11, they're thinking, they're thinking. You know, I remember telling a friend, nothing good can come of this. But upon <laughs> reflection, I, d I did realize that this was, in fact, a missed opportunity. And we've had a number of them. End of the Cold War, 1945. This missed opportunity was simply this. We could have gone to the world and said, you know, we now have suffered on our own soil, you know, for a long, for the first time in a long time, the kind of devastation that most of the rest of you have experienced. We look to you for advice and, and, and uh, support. And it was pouring in. There was an extraordinary candlelight vigil in the streets of Tehran. There was a moment where we could say, okay, we do, there is a threat of, of terrorism, and we're going to approach it with you know, lots of ideas. We're going to open to other ideas. Instead, of course, Bush drew the land, you know, you're either for us or against us, and if you're not with us, you're on the side of the terrorist, and He's we're going to declare, reading children's books. We're, we're going to declare permanent uh, unlimited war on terror instead of, you know, and if you don't agree with that tactic, you're, you're a bad guy. Was, but many other people were saying there's another tactic. It's more like a police operation. You share information on and on. So that's my um, Well, I, I said that uh, you have it uh, harder, but people like you, uh, I'm sure, will we'll keep at it. And um, 
will find a way um, to to bring your government to to reality and to responsibility. Telling your government don't do things that you don't know, you know the consequences are for others. You know, make sure you know what you, you're doing. I'm not sure I can be very optimistic these days, but <laughs> but at least I mean this is this is first of all your responsibility. Uh, your friends across the world, you know, can try and help by being candid, sharing uh, our thoughts, our analysis, our experiences. But at the end of the day, it's really your homework. So good luck. <laughs> um, I could say a lot about some <laughs> comments, but I, but I, I won't. I mean, just um, in terms of. You know, just one, one quick thing, and then I want to say something more optimistic, uh, uh, which is that um, government is not censoring historians. I mean, you know, we can write any books we want to. It doesn't mean people have to buy them, but, but um, um, you know, there, it's, a, it's a choice that people make to write about a certain book or not to write about a certain book. I mean, we, there's a lot of problems in this country, but, but um, being able to write what you want to write uh, is, not, is not one of them. Uh, you know, so, so I think that's, that's just wrong. But... But in, the, in, the, in a more optimistic sense, you know, there is resistance in this country right now. It's not a resistance that is focused on our foreign policy or on the wars that we're fighting um, in Muslim countries and shouldn't be fighting. I certainly agree with it. We shouldn't be fighting them. Um, but I think, you know, the best way for people who want to build a larger consciousness about the problems of militarism and the military budget is to be part of that, that larger struggle. And that struggle as always in, in history, at least in American history, has got to be both, uh, as Jonathan was saying before, inside, outside struggle. You've got to be in the streets when that makes sense to be in the streets. You've got to be building collectivities online and <laughs> in meetings uh, as well. But you also have to, you know, uh, elect people who, you know, can have a little bit of state power because without that, in the end, I mean, as you know, the War Powers Act, you know, that we heard about, uh, uh, before, you know, that got passed, you know, by Congress, you know, it wasn't acted on enough because the anti-war movement was declining by that point for reasons we know, but uh, it did get passed and, you know, and so it's got to be always that inside, outside strategy. It's the only way change ever happens. Thank you.